Are you a gamer? Do you wish that your favorite games were catered to your brand preferences? With more adventures surrounding all your favorite products, from toothpaste to canned goods to computer chips? No? Well, that's too bad, because they exist anyway. To capitalize on the millions of internet users and the online flash games they once gravitated towards, RIP to a real one. A marketing department somewhere at some point thought, you know what, we can make those too. And thus, the previously vastly separated worlds of flash games and advertising were now combined into the new phenomenon of promotional flash games. Games made by advertising companies have been around almost as long as video games themselves. Where there's a way to capitalize on a market and especially appeal to a younger demographic, companies will almost always seize the opportunity. But the first promotional games were physical products that still had to be purchased, so in a way, they would never be fully effective in selling whatever they were selling if the game itself first had to be bought too. Promotional flash games, though, eventually available through the power of the internet, were the answer to this problem. They were free, they were widely available, and they took even less effort to make than a physical release. Once these babies hit the market, gone were the days of the typical boring pop-ups or sideline banners that no one wanted anything to do with. Now, there were ads that weren't just ads, but were games. Games that you clicked on on purpose, instead of being accidentally redirected when just trying to close an advertisement. Surely now that these brands had finally figured out how to grab their younger users' attention, their plan was foolproof, right? Well, no, because they had to actually make good games. And for some reason, fun and engaging flash games are not the strong suit of a mega corporation's marketing department. I know, surprised me too. It turns out that a lot of these marketers' ideas of a fun game was just something overly simple and boring like a bubble popper or a match 3 game that's rebranded with the company logo and motifs. There are no real rules about what the game should feature, so things like fun gameplay, interesting mechanics, or even just appealing products are sometimes completely missing from the very diverse collection of existing promo games. They can be about anything, soap, popsicles, banks, pizza, and can be as simple as a matching puzzle or as complex as a 3D rendered action-packed adventure. Because there are so few guidelines and because some of these companies had no business making games of all things, not every promo game was a hit. It's worth mentioning that not every game that seems to be related to a brand is actually official either, which you might already know if the wide and unfortunate range of unlicensed Frozen games are familiar to you at all. In general, the easiest way to tell if a game is an actual promotional endeavor is by how well or how much the brand is actually shown, or how well or how much a product is described. Aside from those aspects, though, that aren't even always applicable, the realm of promotional games is a lawless land that expands far and wide. Diego Smart is one of the first promotional games I played myself as an unassuming kid perusing primary games. It's set up as an isometric adventure RPG where you play as a photojournalist exploring the desert to take pictures of exotic treasures. But as soon as you click to start, it's pretty clear that Diego Smart is less about the adventure aspect and more so about the camera and memory cards that Diego uses to take his pictures with. On the intro screen, there's a little backstory that explains what Diego is doing and why he's there, but of course the game wants to let you know even more that Diego is using an HP Photosmart 600 series camera, and throughout the levels you pick up HP branded memory cards to fuel your camera and beat the game. It's pretty obvious now that this game is one big advertisement, what with the constant HP branding everywhere throughout it. Even when you fail, the game consoles you by encouraging you to buy cameras and print in real life. But when I was just looking for something fun to do on the computer as a kid, I barely paid attention to what the games I was playing were about and just kept blindly clicking along. And I think that's what makes promotional games so effective. Even if someone did pay more attention to the intent behind the game, they likely just played it anyway. The actual marketing and product placement is minimal enough that it doesn't get in the way of the fun of the game, and by the time you've played even just a few minutes, the advertising has already done its job. 
Another promotional game I played on Primary Games was Mower Mayhem, a racing game where the player rides on epic lawnmowers with even epicer names like Land Scrapper, Turf Terror, or Silver Shredder. The game is about crashing through fences, avoiding lawn flamingos and tree stumps, and collecting and using nitro boosts in the form of spinning Home Depot logos. Who knew landscaping could be an extreme sport? A fitting country-esque background track accompanies you while you play, though it unfortunately isn't the classic Home Depot commercial soundtrack, which does make the game lose some points in my book. I don't care that the song probably didn't exist when this game came out, they should have put it in anyway. This game, along with Diego Smart, are some examples of advertising games that aren't quite as lame as a tile swapper about teeth whitening strips, and were actually kind of fun. As far as advertising goes, they didn't need to include any actual entertainment value if all they were worried about was getting the brand name out there. But as much as these games were pretty blatantly branded, they did go the extra step to at least make them fun to play. The same can't be said, unfortunately, about the large collection of promotional games that are barely even games and are more just interactive ads. While they aren't quite as unimaginative as a rehashed Match 3 game that's now enhanced with American Airline logos, some games that are more creative are still pretty lame. The Chef Boyardee X-Ray Machine is an example of this. While it is at least a little more interesting than a matching game, it's still exactly what it sounds like. Essentially just an interactive product catalog that x-rays each can of food to show what's inside and provide a description and nutritional information. So if you ever wondered what it was like to be in the Chef Boyardee branch of the TSA, here you go, I guess. As much as I make fun of it now, I still know that this is the exact kind of game that I would get weirdly attached to as a kid. Most games only had to have bright colors and moving parts to capture my attention, and I loved a good Chef Boyardee canned ravioli, so I'll admit, maybe I was the target audience for this game all along. Home In on a Price is another game that gets a couple of creativity points for being something other than a low-effort bubble popper, but it's still not very good. Created as a promotion for the real estate company ERA, you're tasked with guessing the exact price of a house listed for sale, kind of like the classic codebreaker game Mastermind, except a lot more dumped down and a lot less interesting. Maybe I set my expectations too high for a game about the exhilarating thrills of the real estate market. Or maybe it's not the subject matter that's the problem here. Diego Smart, along with this other driving game made by HP, are about memory cards and digital cameras. Sure, the products themselves are kind of dull on their own, especially in the eyes of most kids, but Beetle Buggin, a game where you drive around a mini racetrack made of pushpins, books, and floppy disks, like you're in an HP and Volkswagen branded Katamari level, is way cooler than the Chef Boyardee TSA simulator, and I'd much rather eat Chef Boyardee over floppy disks. I don't think you necessarily have to have an appealing product or even be very original with a promotional game design, it just has to be engaging. This Omaha Stakes game I also played as a kid isn't the most involved experience, but it's quirky and at least has an actual goal to work towards. Kid Cuisine Space Shooter is a little unoriginal, but at least there's more to the gameplay than guessing a number or x-raying canned spaghetti. Platformers like The Chase by Intel and Cheetos Chase are easy to grasp and play. There are so many examples of this kind of formula, from Cup of Soup themed Pac-Man ripoffs to Dairy Queen mini golf courses to Taco Bell Taco Foo fighting games that all seem to do a better job at making something more entertaining than a Diet Coke branded game of Sudoku. Not that the bar was set very high on that one. As much as there are a lot of kids that may be mindless enough to click on almost every game they see, speaking from experience, it doesn't mean that just because it has pretty pictures of the Travelocity Gnome or a Burger King Whopper that they'll stick around. And isn't that the whole point of these games? To not only grab your attention, but to make you spend as much time as possible playing them so that the brand or product sticks in your mind even after you're done? I don't know, I'm no marketing major, but as a well-seasoned peruser of promotional games myself, I think that one of the best ways to make something memorable, even beyond entertaining game mechanics or exciting graphics, is to put the game in a memorable website itself. 
That way it almost doesn't matter if one or all of the games kind of suck, because there's plenty more to choose from, meanwhile all being packaged in an entire branded experience. While a single game on its own may have had a harder time retaining an audience, websites that were branded as a game's hub, or better yet, a virtual world, would always have the upper hand. Extra features like avatars, special codes and prizes, and just a general gaming atmosphere were dedicated to making you play the games and remember the name. Buildabear.com had a section of the site that I always loved to spend time on as a kid. It wasn't a very pretty website, at least not as far as I or the Wayback Machine can remember but it hosted a good amount of games that were all themed around their bear mascots. It did break one of the unofficial Dream Jelly Cardinal rules of promotional games by having an unfortunate amount of matching games, but at the very least, having something like a consistent theme that carries across the different games really ties everything together and encourages more time spent on the site. That and having certified classics like Fluffed and Fabulous and Very Scary Halloween. <laughs> bear puns. Other sites like PopTarts.com or Wonka.com were similar to Build-A-Bear in that it wasn't all about the games, but they had a decent games section to keep you entertained. I talk more about the Wonka gaming experience in my Willy Wonka video if you happen to be interested in that. But what's better than just a hyperlink to a section full of promotional games? An entire stylized menu and world surrounding those promotional games, full of animations, easter eggs, and extra features that a simple list just doesn't live up to. Nabisco World was set up as an interactive virtual theme park centered around snack foods, and the list of cracker and cookie themed games is long. There's a Chips Ahoy Room Decorator, Wheat Thin Solitaire, Oreo Shuffleboard, Fig Newton's Bike Racing, Jello Ping Pong, Are You Hungry Yet? The games aren't exactly amazing or original, but there's a lot of them, and they're offered in a fun and interactive site, so despite Oreo Shuffleboard maybe not being everyone's favorite online pastime, it likely still beats a standalone game of M&M's Reversi every time. Postopia functioned similarly to Nabisco World with a serial-themed overworld of sorts, and enough variation among the games that it was nearly impossible to not find a game that you at least kind of liked, which is all it took for me at least to end up spending hours at a time on a single Flash game about fruity pebbles. And even more involved than Postopia was Millsbury, the also serial-themed but much more expansive competitor of Postopia back in the day. Both of these websites are lost media now, but the fact that I and so many other people have such fond memories surrounding what is just one big advertisement wrapped in a gaming package clearly shows how well they were coded to the average Flash gamer's desires. Millsbury was, I'll say it, better than Postopia, even if I spent hours on those Fruity Pebbles games, because it wasn't just a collection of games. It was more like a community or social media site, all centered around the theme of General Mills cereals. Between avatar customization, house decorating, and of course a variety of arcade games to earn Mills bucks in, Millsbury was quite the promotional game powerhouse of its time, especially compared to its competition. And just to promote myself in the already promotion-filled video, I also talk about Postopia and Millsbury more in my video about American cereals if you're a bit of a cereal head yourself. Other brands like Coca-Cola and Build-A-Bear would later expand on the community idea and make virtual worlds of their own, dropping the previous lackluster game sections and making a more interactive hub to draw in even more players and make them really feel like they could go for an overpriced stuffed bear and a coke right now. One virtual world that featured promotional games wasn't like the rest, though. It didn't have a theme park entirely based on snack foods, or a town named after a cereal company. With a cult following of its own and a leading edge in its field, Neopets was a site that had no specific marketing in mind at all, but couldn't seem to bear the thought of passing up a sponsorship. Neopets is a virtual world that's based around taking care of imaginary animals as pets. You can feed them, take care of them, and of course play promotional flash games with them. I find the promo games in Neopets so interesting because, again, Neopets didn't have a specific intention for marketing. It seemingly just took any sponsorship from demographic-appropriate brands and welcomed the expansive collection of promotional games that came with it. There are food brands like Nestle, 
Kellogg's, McDonald's, and Coca-Cola promoting snacks, media companies like Disney, Paramount Pictures, and Cartoon Network promoting their shows and movies, and anything else from dental hygiene providers to battery makers all jumping on the Neopets train to pump out some promotional games to shill to kids. I never really played on Neopets when I was younger, as it was a little too complex for my still-developing brain to fully grasp. Plus, I was a Webkin's main through and through, and they clearly had beef between each other, so I had to pick a side. So I'm willing to bet that back in the day, I wouldn't have thought twice, or even once, about the fact that so many of these games were just advertisements. But looking at it now, all of these Neopets promo games just seem… weird. Given that pretty much every promotional game is made to target a young audience that's just looking to play silly games online, I wouldn't say any of them exactly had good intentions. Not even the seemingly innocent bystanders like the Build-A-Bear games that just want you to wash your hands and hug your friends. Advertising to kids is a pretty controversial subject because kids don't usually have the capacity to understand that they're being marketed to. And this is especially true when it comes to supposedly harmless little flash games floating around the internet. But of all the promotional flash games online, they're at least for the most part contained within themselves, if that makes sense. <laughs> to get to the serial games, you usually have to go to the serial website. But in Neopets, there's all kinds of different advertisers all existing in the same space together, and they're all targeting their players all at once. I think the term I'm looking for is… uh, sellout? I can already hear the angry Neopets fans in the comments. Look, I know I'm mostly biased because of the Webkins vs Neopets drama, but it all just feels kind of icky. Sites like Millsbury and Postopia that I loved to frequent in my younger years aren't really any better, but still, there's something about the Neopets promotional games that just makes me question their place on the site. That being said, as much fun as I had racing Home Depot lawnmowers and collecting memory cards for my HP 600 series camera, I think I've come to the conclusion that I'm actually questioning the place of all of these promotional games on the whole internet. Bold statement, I know. But unfortunate as it is, advertising is just part of the package when it comes to the online experience. So I guess if I have to be marketed to, I'll at least be glad that it's sometimes pretty fun when it happens. A huge thank you to B22, Bradley T, Kayla Geary, Brett Morgan, Bunzo, Dylan Webb, Joe Cheesman, Johan Ake, Kevin Evans, Mark Kent, Mr. Pants, M. Wee, Paper Sam, Pixel Puppy, Sarah, The Goomba Mattress, Unan Almondor, and the rest of my patrons for supporting me. I hope you'll all enjoy the super exciting Dream Jelly branded promotional game I've made just for you. It'll be available real soon, I'm just waiting to hear back from Neopets first. <laughs>